Well, thank you, Lawrence, for getting us started with our last webinar of 2021. It has definitely been a roller coaster of a year. I'm very excited that we're ending the year with an exclamation point, a big exclamation point, with some of the best cataract surgeons and some of the best cataract surgical trainers in the world. We have Dr. Hayapriya, Dr. Prashant Garg, and Dr. Vasavita joining us. They're each going to present a very special case or a special surgical consideration as you plan your cataract cases. And then we're gonna have a Q&A session for each of them at the end. So our first speaker is Dr. Hayapriya, who certainly needs no introduction. She will be uh, talking about subluxated cataracts, how to plan and manage them interoperatively. Uh, Dr. Arvind, thank you so much for joining us. And the screen is over to you, madam. Thank you, Hunter, and uh, side by side for this wonderful opportunity. I hope my slides are visible. I'm going to be talking on subluxated cataracts and uh, capsular bag stabilizing devices today. Uh, I'll be delving more on uh, cases which have more severe zonular lysis. So starting with indications for surgery in patients with lens subluxation, the indications would include patients who have either defective vision, even if they have a gross subluxation, uh, which could be either because of the cataract or the aphakic status, if they have a double vision, or if the nucleus is either in the anterior chamber or in the vitreous cavity. So it's important to have a complete uh, preoperative analysis. Uh, we look for everything from the corneal status, the status of the iris and the pupil, the anterior chamber depth, which could either be too deep or, or shallow based on where the lens is, presence of vitreous in the AC that will help us know how to approach the uh, cataract and the need for vitrectomy as we start the surgery. When coming to the lens, we look at the type of uh, subluxation, if it is more localized, in which case it may be either mild, moderate, or severe, or it could be just be a diffuse uh, subluxation, as we would see in, in patients with the sort of exfoliation uh, and spherophagic lenses. So the important aspects when coming to dealing with the Dealing with the surgery, uh, I would go step by step. The most important aspect would be to do a good capsulorexis because if you want to use any of the devices like a CTR or hooks, uh, capsulorexis are mandatory. So a lot of effort is taken to ensure we use a uh, good viscoelastic so you can make a complete adequate sized rexis. If required, use a stain as well as this could help not just in the rexis but also to insert your uh, hooks and the CTR as well. So when dealing with the rexis, you would normally like to use a high molecular weight viscoelastic and start the rexis away from the site of the zonular dialysis. This is because you have good uh, counter traction at the site where the zonules are intact and then move towards the site of subluxation, but make it much smaller at this site because there's a high risk that the rexis might run away. So one has to be uh, sure that you uh, are not making it too large at this, site, at this site because we don't want to have a rexus extension. The other uh, important aspect after we have the rexus complete is to plan for the devices. The two most important devices would be to use the capsule tension ring and to use the hooks. The capsule uh, tension ring comes as a PMA ring and we have the eyelets such that they just cross when placed in the capsular bag. So based on the uh, capsular bag size, we may have an option of different size of a CTR. Most cases would just work well with 11, 13 size CTR. In myopes, you could use a 12, 14.5. And in small lenses, fear of fake eyes, nanophthalmos, one could use a 10, 12.5 size uh, capsule tension ring. The second important aspect is to use uh, capsule retractors. Uh, I also use iris retractors to support the capsular bag. So this tends to work well. I use the Grish Haber hooks. And I feel this is extremely important. I would say even more than the CTR as you're starting your case, because using these hooks can help in uh, Rexus completion to insert your CTR and during the phaco emulsification as well. And once these hooks are in place, this will tend to stay till the end of surgery until the IOL is placed in the bag. Because even if you have the CTR in place, the capsular bag can still be wobbly. So you want to have these hooks to be able to support the bag until you place the IOL. So this again is a patient who has more than six clock hours on dialysis. I'm uh, injecting 
high molecular weight viscoelastic through the side put and trying to push the lens down. There's a little amount of tilt here. The excess, as mentioned earlier, you would start it at the site, which is away from the area of maximum zonular loss. You will not make it too small because you want to have enough working space. But again, uh, you risk the, extent, uh, the, the chance of extension if you make it too large as well. So you want to make it just right, kind of have a, a, a right balance. Once the hooks are in place, the first thing I would think of is to use the hooks. So this is a regular iris hook, please have a hooks and this going through a uh, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 millimeter stab incision. So these are inserted about one hook for every two clock hours. So in this video, it has been placed at the limbus, but you could go a little more periphery, a little more posteriorly, uh, more on the cerebral side when you want to grab the dexis margin. So after the hooks are in place, before inserting the CTR, I prefer to do a hydro dissection. Again, hydro has to be done very well in these cases because uh, there's, a, you know, it, there's a difficulty in removing the cortex once the CTR is in place. So a good hydro, you can also see the rim at that point. After this point, I would like to insert the CTR. And I prefer to uh, insert the CTR manually, not going through the main tunnel with the injector, but going through the side port because this way, the chamber is well formed. Make sure the leading eyelet goes in the bag. And when dialing the trailing eyelet, I would uh, use the help of the second instrument, the Sinsky hook, to support the CTR from the exterior side. So this can also help to ensure the trailing eyelet goes in the bag. So it doesn't slip into the sulcus or into the angle. So you ensure the CTR goes in the bag. Now, sometimes you find that in patients who have you know, more severe subluxation, a uh, CTR itself may not be enough for uh, capsular bag stabilization, more so in the post-operative period, because if you have a patient with progressive zonular loss, like a patient with Marfan syndrome or spherophagic lens, or even a, a large dramatic uh, subluxation in a young patient, then you'll have the concern that this IOL capsular bag complex would decenter or dislocate uh, after a couple of years. So, I think what is very useful is to use other devices. And one such device is the Sioni ring. And the Sioni ring is basically a CTR, which has a loop uh, on the interior, either one or two loops are there. And this can be used to fix the ring to the sterile uh, wall. And this will ensure your bag is well centered. So before the ring is inserted into the capsular bag, you'll find that it is a thread has already been passed. It's pre-threaded. The ring would go into the capsular bag and the loop on the Sioni ring would come onto the sulcus. And once it's in the sulcus, the ring is fixed to the sleeve. So the capsular bag and the Sioni ring and the lens uh, finally are well centered. So this is uh, the case, the case which has a more severe uh, subluxation. And as you can see, the lens is tilting posteriorly. Uh, so though uh, this is a gross subluxation, you know, if you have a good amount of viscoelastic, you always have to use forceps in these eyes because the zonules are very weak and have more of a centripetal force. And remember not to make the rexes too large at the site of maximum zonal lysis. So here I'm trying to insert the uh, iris hook onto the rexes margin, but the lens is more posterior. So one tip here is to lift the capsular bag gently with a spatula. So use your non-dominant hand and lift the capsular bag. And a spatula is safe because it's a blunt instrument. And as you lift it, you can then place your hook to hold onto the rexis margin. So you now have support uh, uh, anteriorly to support the capsular bag. And here I'm using about four hooks for uh, this patient. Uh, uh, hydro dissection is done at this point. A uh, hydro has to be good here. At this patient, I've not used a CTR yet because I would like to insert a Sioni ring. So when doing phacomulsification, one has to be uh, careful to remember that the zonules are weak. But just see, you know, once you have the right setting, so if my OB is lesser than what I would normally uh, have and uh, lower flow rate, lower vacuum, but once you have your settings in place and uh, slow motion phacomulsification, the capsular bag is kind of stable because of these hooks. So these hooks have to be there to prevent any lens bobbling, to give stability to the lens bag. And, but one has to remember to keep the phaco tip more towards the center. We do not want to have 
too much of turbulence in the anterior chamber and remove all the, uh, the nucleus and the epinucleus. At any point in time, if there is a vitreous prolapse, one obviously would have to do a vitrectomy and then continue with phacomulsification. The ring is not in place yet. Cortex is aspirated, and this is this can be difficult uh, when you have weak zonules, more so if you have the CTR in place, but very gentle aspiration. As you can see, there is no equatorial support here because we have no ring, and uh, that means the fornix of the bag can come towards the pupillary center. So you may have to inject viscoelastic in between a couple of times and uh, just to ensure that your dialysis does not enlarge. After the cortex is aspirated, I am pre-threading the Sioni ring with a nino-proline suture. Now, how do we insert it? I'd like to insert it through the main tunnel because we have this additional loop. And the other tip I would like you to remember is that you will have to insert such that the convex part of the ring is inserted first. So that's the direction you would take. Uh, so once that is done, the trailing eyelet is also dialed into the bag. So the CTR, I would like to go into the side board, but the Sione ring has no option. You'll have to have an adequate size incision. I would prefer a 2.8 millimeter incision. Ensure the ring, both the eyelets are in the capsular bag. And once the loop is brought into the sulcus, so you can do this by just detracting the uh, rexus margin with a Kuglin's hook and bring this loop into the sulcus and to the area where that is maximum subluxation at the site where you want to fix the capsular bag to the sleeve. Now to fix it, I'm using uh, doing the Hoffman's uh, pocket, which is a wonderful tip by Richard Hoffman. So this is something where it will enable the knot to go into the pocket. I'm passing a 26 gauge needle about 2.5 millimeter from the limbus to railroad this suture needle, uh, which has been uh, passed uh, through the main incision. And the second uh, needle is also uh, retrieved uh, from the main tunnel through this uh, spherical bed using the 26 gauge needle. So once this is done, the suture which is in the pocket, so the two ends of the suture are then brought out using a Kuglin's hook. Um, and once that is done, the two ends are then tied together. So a couple of knots, about five or six knots would six secure the bag. All the time have an eye on the bag to see we don't want to pull the bag way too close to the site where it's being fixed, but you will have to have a more central nexus as much as possible. Again, the hooks go back. So I removed the hook when I'm centering it, but once I place the lens, to place the lens, it's always good to have as less stress on the capsular bag as possible. So the hooks go back, a three-piece IOL is placed in the bag. Why are three-piece? Because in spite of a Sioni ring, uh, there may be an IOL decentration later on. So in case that happens, it's easier to fixate a three-piece IOL to either the iris or to the sclera. So that is why a three-piece IOL has been uh, opted for. So this is the post-operative picture of a patient. So you may also consider using a double loop a Sioni if you have a more gross subluxation, for example, a child with Marfan syndrome. Most of these patients would tend to have some form of post-op complications or the other. Most commonly, you could have raised IOP and uh, secondary glaucoma, which is not uncommon uh, in these patients who, have, who tend to have other comorbidities as well. Capsular phimosis can also happen. PCO, there's a higher risk. And of course, there's a risk of capsular bag uh, IOL complex uh, decentration of this location. But if one does take a little effort for the pre-op workup, and the meticulous uh, surgery and uh, adequate follow-up, we can give these patients a good outcome. Thank you. No, thank you, Dr. Harper. That was a beautiful presentation. And certainly I appreciated how you talked about surgical planning, going slow, keeping control, having several options with the hooks, with the rings. I think all of that is very important. So our next speaker, we're moving from zonules to corneal endothelium is Dr. Prashant Gurg, who certainly needs no introduction. He's the director uh, of uh, LV Prasad. He's a good friend of Orbis and has been all around the world on the plane. Uh, Dr. Garg, thank you so much for joining us today. We very much look forward to your talk. Uh, thank you, Hunter Charvik. Uh, uh, greetings from Hyderabad and uh, First of all, I'd like to thank CyberSight for including me in this wonderful program where I had the opportunity to hear other two colleagues as well. So let me begin this uh, uh, talk by a case of 70-year-old lady who had poor outcome after 
cataract surgery in one of the eyes and now has developed poor vision even in the other eye. The corneal picture was in the operated eye as shown on this slide. This is the status of the other eye. Uh, cornea looks compact. The lens showed nuclear sclerosis. However, a careful retroillumination showed a uh, metal beaten appearance. And when we focused the illumination toward corneal endothelium, this beaten metal appearance was much more obvious. The question is, what are the possible causes of this poor outcome in the eye that was operated first? I'm sure you will all realize that such poor outcomes are because of a prolonged complicated surgery. Similar situation can occur in toxic anterior segment syndrome or any other cause that can result in endothelial cell loss. But one of the other cause that is becoming important, particularly with the cornea showing a beaten metal appearance is a Fuchs endothelial dystrophy. The second question that we need to answer in this patient is, how are we going to manage or take care of the second eye such that we do not end up having the same situation as the previous eye? So the first thing that is most important is that we should be aware of this condition, which is called as a Fuchs endothelial dystrophy. It is a condition which causes progressive uh, loss of endothelium. And in the later part, when the critical mass of endothelial cells is lost, it results in corneal edema. And this condition poses unique challenges if it remains unidentified. It can result in prolonged corneal edema. It can also lead to irreversible corneal edema. And in some cases, you may be lucky, but it lead to the uh, 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 corneal edema in the later part after, for a few months, the cornea had been clear. One must remember that the signs of Fuchs endothelial dystrophy appeared before symptoms. And therefore, most clinicians tend to confuse a reduction in vision primarily to cataract if, and are not able to identify and then subsequently end up having these complications. So it is very important that we perform a thorough clinical examination, including a slit beam evaluation of corneal endothelium in every patient of cataracts. Subsequently, if you identify these uh, metal beaten appearance on the corneal endothelium, you must assess the function as well as the morphology of corneal endothelium using specular microscopy as well as pachymetry. As a third step, you must then classify the patients into the severity grade. The most milder form of endothelial dystrophy is where the patients have no corneal edema, corneal thickness is less than 580 micron, and the endothelial cell count is more than 1500 cells per square millimeter. In a grade two, the patient usually complain of morning blurring of vision. And as shown in this video, you will be able to see some stripe indicative of mild, uh, mild corneal edema. The pachymetry should be less than 620 microns for you to grade it uh, moderate or grade two. And the endothelial cell count may be less than 1500, but more than 1200. However, in the severe grade of Fuchs endothelial dystrophy, you will have obvious corneal edema as shown in this video that is, 
will result in corneal thickness of more than 620 micron and endothelial cell counts are usually less than 800 micro, 800 cells per cubic millimeter. Once you have classified the disease as a next step, you must decide on the management of the case. And the management is based on the severity of endothelial dysfunction and the cataract grade. Different surgical options that are available to manage these cases of combined cataract and Fuchs endothelial dystrophy are performing cataract surgery alone, cataract surgery followed by corneal surgery if required, and a third option is to do combined cataract and corneal surgery. But how do we make that decision? In a grade one, where you have uh, no corneal edema and corneal thickness is less than 580 micron, you can go ahead with the cataract surgery alone, but you need to take some consideration for protecting compromised corneal endothelium. In grade two, you have both options, and it will primarily be dependent upon the grade of the cataract. Depending upon the grade of nuclear sclerosis or hardness of the cataract, you can plan to do combined surgery, or if you are convinced that endothelial density is good and thickness of the decimate membrane is not visually compromising, you can counsel the patient for cataract surgery with an option of doing corneal surgery in case corneal edema appears. With decimate membrane endothelial keratoplasty, there is a tilt toward advising combined surgery even in this grade of Fuchs endothelial dystrophy. However, the decision is much straightforward in grade three Fuchs endothelial dystrophy because the cornea is already edematous and therefore you will have to take care of cataract as well as corneal disease. Once you have decided on cataract surgery alone in grade one or grade two, some of the factors or the planning and preparation that will be necessary are, number one, decide about the technique of cataract surgery based on the severity. In milder cataract or less dense cataract, phacoemulsification is always superior. However, if you have moderate grade of Fuchs endothelial dystrophy and the cataract is brunescent, it is always advisable to perform combined procedure rather than cataract surgery alone. Even while performing cataract surgery, you will like to modulate power such that there is the endothelial cell loss is reduced. You may switch to uh, the pulse mode or the burst mode of cataract surgery. In addition, you have to use viscoelastic and soft shell technique comes very handy in the situation where you have a cohesive viscoelastic in the center surrounded by, by uh, a dispersive viscoelastic that is retained in the eye for a much longer period of time and continue to provide protection to this compromised endothelium. You may have to fill the anterior chamber with viscoelastic repeatedly in order to provide necessary protection. If after doing a good cataract surgery, patient has developed post-operative corneal edema, there is no need to panic. Start these patients on a conventional post-operative regimen. And if you are lucky, the corneal edema will resolve and the patient will gain vision. However, if the edema is persistent and is not resolving, you can subsequently do a, a decimate stripping endothelial keratoplasty or decimate membrane endothelial keratoplasty. And most of these patients regain very good visual acuity postoperatively. So in summary, what we learned today from this case is that an early diagnosis is crucial. And for that, a good clinical examination plays a crucial role. The choice of surgical procedure depends upon the stage of the dystrophy as well as the density of cataract. 
you may consider modifying cataract you must consider modifying cataract surgery so as to reduce endothelial cell loss a good pre operative counseling will help good post operative management of these cases thank you very much for your kind attention Professor, that was fantastic. I think one of the things I saw in both your talk and Dr. Harapriya's is the importance of quality viscoelastic. When you know you have a compromised eye, whether it's the endothelium or the zonules, having good quality viscoelastics are critical. I also think the workup, and I liked how you kind of classified or stratify the patients based on what you found preoperatively so you don't have postoperative surprises. Well, um, I'm very, very grateful to have Dr. Vasavda join us. Uh, she is a master surgeon. I've been in the OR with her before. I love when I watch her operate, she changes her parameters and has more settings and is the most controlled surgeon I've seen with different settings and parameters for cataract surgery. So Dr. Vasavda, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for all that you do for cataract training. Over to you, madam. Thank you so much, Hunter. Thank you, uh, Orbis Cybersight, and uh, most importantly, Hunter. And thank you for those words of praise. But really, I feel intimidated presenting after Dr. Haripriya and Dr. Prashant Garg. And I think it's easier for me because they talked about preventing complications, and I'll talk about what I do very often. That is, what do you do when you uh, create a complication? So my case today is going to be something that uh, I started off as a very routine cataract case, a young lady, a bilateral posterior subcapsular cataracts, and she had pre-existing regular corneal astigmatism. So we have planned a toric monofocal IOL in this case. Now, what we will see is what happens when you expected a smooth sailing surgery, and then it doesn't end up that way and the capsule ruptured. Now, this is just to show that this is the kind of a very soft, uh, juicy cataract, and you would not be worried about how technically you can perform this case. So what uh, we do, and this is uh, one of my, one of our uh, trainee surgeons here, and what we do is a, what we call a nucleotomy or a modified divide and conquer type of a technique where we do a deep sculpting with very, very low parameters. And as Hunter pointed out, uh, the flow rate here is about uh, 14 and very low vacuum and low ultrasound energy, only 20% of torsional ultrasound because we don't want to eat through that nucleus. The idea is to perform a deep sculpt so that horizontal separation of the heminuclei becomes very easy. Now here, I think what is very important is as you can see the first uh, half, the two halves are being created and everything looks fine. What we do need to remember is that when you're sculpting, it, the lens is not a, the capsule is not straight, it has a curve. So when you sculpt, you need to follow that curve, otherwise you could land up in trouble. And as you can see here, the surgeon is very confidently going ahead and uh, it's a cortical cataract. So the red glow is not the perfect, especially after a hydro dissection, but you can see that things are happening quite okay. Although we cannot really see what is happening at the base or the very deepest level. Now, having created four quadrants in the nucleus, then the surgery moves forward. And now the removal of these fragments has started. Uh, again, modest parameters, everything looks very much in control. The anterior chamber is not fluctuating too much. But keep your eye open on this side. Something seems to have come up, but I, the surgeon has still not noticed because the nucleus is rotating very smoothly and quadrant removal is being performed. As more and more of the nucleus, this piece goes in, that's when probably things will become clearer and the surgeon will notice what is actually going on behind. And you can see by now, most of us can make out this area of the posterior capsule rupture. And it is only now that it actually becomes clear and you know that something is going wrong, but the surgeon still goes ahead, hesitating a little bit, not sure what to do. So I think that is one important thing I wanted to point out that there will be times when you may not be sure of the degree or the presence of a posterior capsule rupture. If there's anything, don't try to over manipulate, inject a dispersive viscoelastic and then come out like the surgeon did and then try and see. You may even use a forceps to move your globe to enhance the red glow or the visibility. Now, uh, I have a poll question if uh, Lawrence could help us put it up. When do you think the PCR may have occurred? 
uh, I think most of us have figured it by now, but would, do you think it's too much of a deep sculpting or do you think it was too much energy or vacuum during removing this very jelly-like fragment that caused the PCR? And you can now start answering the question and we have about 30 seconds to poll and then Dr. Vasavada will continue to talk. Uh, Dr. Vasavada, I love how you were demonstrating, you know, going slow. I think that's one of the things I appreciate as the audience is um, answering this question. I definitely think one of the things all the surgeons have done in complicated cases is talk about not losing control, taking time. And so when you do have a PCR or notice something, not losing control. So here are your answers, Dr. Vasavada. What was so, your opinion and what did you see? Uh, I think what we I realized retrospectively after watching the video is it was probably the deep sculpting when the last pieces were being separated. Like I said, the capsule typically is curved. And when you sculpt, if you are going flat, if you are not following the curve of that, and if you go flat, you are more likely to rupture the capsule mechanically or with your ultrasound energy. So in my opinion, this happened during because of the deep sculpting and not during fragment removal. So now the thing is, how do you move forward? You know you have a PCR, half of your nucleus is still inside the capsular bag and you don't see any obvious vitreous coming into the anterior chamber. So what would you do? The best thing like uh, has been shown also by Dr. Haripriya and Dr. Prashant uh, is to inject good viscoelastic. Ideally, it would be a dispersive viscoelastic, but even if you don't have access to that, inject whatever you have and then only come out of the eye. The next step, which I find very useful now, is to inject trimcinolone acetonide. And thanks to Orolab, we now have a preservative version, preservative free version available. So we don't need to dilute or have a compounding pharmacy make it. It's ready made. And we just inject about 0.1 ml of this through a side port, of course. Not we now also want to be very conscious to not use the main port as much as possible, even though it's a self-sealing 2.2 millimeter incision. And we can see here that there is no much vitreous presenting, but once you have such a big rupture, it is crucial to perform an anterior vitrectomy before we perform any kind of maneuvers. And I think it would it, it may be very tempting to enlarge the incision and uh, sort of do an extra capsular or an SICS kind of a nucleus delivery at this stage, but that is something we should all shy away from and try and avoid in these cases because then you are surely inviting much more vitreous and also probably enlarging the capsular rupture. So another poll question, once you have a PCR with some fragment already in the bag, what would be your preferred method of anterior vitrectomy? Would you go bimanual limbal or pars plana? And uh, we can have the audience vote on that. Yes, Dr. Vasavda. And while the audience is uh, answering, I, I think you raised a really good point. You want chamber stability and control. As soon as you have egress of fluid out of the chamber, the vitreous is gonna follow and potentially enlarge that rupture. So keeping control, using OVD to fill space, not immediately pulling your instruments out of the eye. I think those are all critical things. Another thing you mentioned, I just wanna reinforce because I've seen it so many times, is where people put the protractor through the main wound and now you have all this fluid gushing out. If you're not comfortable using the limbal uh, or a paracentesis, uh, putting a stitch through the main wound so you have better chamber stability uh, is probably the best thing. And I think we have the answers up now for you, Dr. Vasava. So I think uh, we have almost uh, equally divided. Uh, both are good provided, uh, as Hunter said, use the side ports. It's always crucial to do a bimanual vitrectomy and not use the main port. If you do, please take one or two sutures depending on the size of your incision and then go through it. But uh, as you will see in this case, I find, and now most uh, surgeons at our center, we have learned a very hard way that performing pass plana vitrectomy as a cataract surgeon, I am not a trained retinal surgeon, is not that difficult because here the aim is just to perform a limited anterior vitrectomy. You don't want to do a core vitrectomy. All we need to modify in our technique is uh, do a conjunctival peritomy and about 3.5 to 4 millimeters behind the limbus, you uh, put in an entry either with your MVR knife, about a 1.2 millimeter knife, or if you have access to uh, self-sealing trocars, you could use one of those. The good part is that most FACO machines today are compatible with 23 gauge vitrectomy. So you don't really need to have a specialized vitrectomy machine. You can use your FACO machine and use the vitrector probe that is available. What you will need to do is use the irrigation 
through the corneal side port and the vitrector through the uh, trocar or the MVR knife, as you will see here. One big challenge is to create that pass plana opening. And you can see this trocar in this soft open eye. So if you have a trocar, it's sometimes very difficult. So it, that's why I said you can always open up the conjunctiva and make a stab, stab knife entry. There is nothing wrong about that. As you see here, the vitrector is coming from behind and the irrigation is from above. And the stained uh, triamcinolone is helping us to visualize. Why should we do this as opposed to a limbal approach? Because here you are pulling the vitreous down into the cavity rather than a limbal where we are pulling it up more towards the anterior chamber. So that I think is a good idea. And yes, it sounds a little uh, scary to begin with, but it's not difficult to learn if you uh, practice it gradually whenever the situation arises. I would like to use the maximum cut rate possible on my machine, which in this case is 4,000. The vacuum has to be modest, let's say about 350 to 400. But the uh, irrigation pressure, your bottle height or your IOP needs to be low and your flow rate needs to be low because we don't want too much movement happening in the anterior or posterior segment. But what you do need is a high cut rate because we don't want to aspirate, we want to cut that vitreous attachments. Now, once a vitrectomy is done, then we proceed with FACO as normal, but again, going very, very slow, the intraocular pressure has been lowered to 20. And the thing is, because there is no vitreous, you are not worried about pulling in anything. If, if the same thing, if you try to do with without an anterior vitrectomy, you are definitely pulling in more vitreous. And therefore, in the long run, chances of detachments, macular edema, glaucoma, all these are going to be much more. And we are using a very low flow rate, low vacuum, and required energy to try and remove this. And you see that in spite of this huge open capsule, nothing is going behind. So it's not like the side instrument is doing anything. Also, if you notice here, the irrigation has been separated from the FACO probe. So that means the irrigation is being used through the side port and the FACO probe is acting as an aspirating device. Uh, something like the bimanual FACO or the FACO knit, uh, which was very popular several years back. Now we have managed to remove the entire nucleus without causing any further damage to the eye. Now the stage of cortex removal. Here again, bimanual irrigation aspiration I find very useful because it allows the closed chamber and it allows us stress-free access to 360 degrees. Try and remove as much from the area away from the PCR so that the cortex that you remove last should be the one in the area of PCR. In case something goes wrong, you still have removed rest of the cortex. And here also keeping your irrigation in the middle of the eye to keep the chamber formed and not allowing it to uh, collapse. It's, sometimes I don't want to use too much vacuum, so I will also mechanically feed the uh, cortex into the aspiration port because I want to work at a modest vacuum, about 150 as you see here. Now, uh, the last poll question, once you have cleared the bag and now remember that this was supposed to be a toric intraocular lens, would you still go ahead with a, any form of a single piece hydrophobic or a hydrophilic acrylic IOL? Or would you do a ciliary sulcus implantation and just leave it there or capture it through the anterior capsular axis now? So that is, I, that I just want to find out what the audience would think. And while they're polling, I think one of the things I really appreciate about your entire hospital and, and eye center, Dr. Vasavid, is how you record every single surgery. You never know when you're going to have a teaching case or a complication. And those are the ones that you're going to learn the most from. So, you know, your center has amazing surgical videos, and I just encourage everyone listening to constantly be recording and going back and looking at your surgical videos. Yeah, so I think uh, most of us would, and, and I would agree, would either do a ciliary sulcus implantation or put it, put the entire IOL in the uh, sulcus and capture the optic through the anterior capsular axis. But there is also the uh, option of, doing a posterior capsular axis in this situation, if you can. And then, so I'm just, I'm not sure whether I'll be able to do this. So what I'm doing is I'm using micro incision forceps and pulling the margins of this tear because it's a rough, rough edge. So I'm trying to convert it into a strong posterior capsular axis. Let's say I can't do that. I still have a good anterior capsular axis and I can still do the sulcus implantation. So yes, not every time you can do this, but it's worth trying in certain situations. And fortunately, we could manage on both sides to create a, a strong margin. And therefore now, 
a single piece uh, hydrophobic acrylic toric iol is being implanted no financial interest but the point here is that you have to you might enlarge your incision a little bit because you don't want a very jerky iol implantation even if you if you are doing a three piece iol and very slowly dial it into position now this is something that is controversial some people might not agree with my decision of putting a single piece lens in the capsular bag but because i could create a posterior capsular axis on both sides at least almost i felt more confident but yes just doing a three piece any form of a three piece foldable or a single piece pmma iol in the ciliary sulcus is still i think a very very good idea the other point i just wanted to highlight is even if it's a 2.2 mm incision i'm going to suture it because uh, these wounds you don't want to leak and once the iol is in the bag i'm going to do a reverse optic capture that means push the optic up through the anterior capsular axis so that this toric lens is not going to rotate any further but like i said this is not something that you need to do now you could do an bimanual irrigation aspiration or even use your vitrector in the ia uh, cut mode where you aspirate and cut finally you want to uh, close the or hydrate the wounds and maintain a chamber before you come out of the eye and this is what the eye looks like to our uh, good fortune 3 months and 6 months down the line doing very well i think i just want to add one or two points before i end what i think is very very important is to have so called a pcr ready kit because every time especially if you are the your staff is new even if you may be the most experienced surgeon they sometimes go in a panic mode so there there should be a sort of separate set of instruments which and devices which you will need if something goes wrong like a suture trims in alone never uh, come out without injecting any viscoelastic and never inject a single piece lens uh, hydrophilic or phobic acrylic iol in the ciliary sulcus thank you thank you so much dr vasavada that what a great set of uh, videos again just stressing the importance of surgical planning knowing the anatomy whether it's the zonules the endothelium or the posterior capsule Uh, we'll start with Dr. Hyerpriya as she began with some questions. One was, how would the density of the cataract affect your planning when you know that you have preoperative zonulopathy or zonular weakness? Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, I think uh, when you have a more a hard lens, one would have to stabilize the capsular bag. So I would use a CTR there. Now the cataract which was uh, just uh, shared, that cataract was not very hard, so I. Just use the Sioni ring, and the Sioni ring is best placed when the capsular bag is empty after you have removed the nucleus. But if it's a hard lens, I would like support uh, uh, in the capsular fornix, so I use a CTR. And if there is a need to fix the capsular bag for the sclera, I would use a capsule tension segment and then fix the capsular bag for the sclera. But yes, so the cataract density would matter, so it would change the plan. A soft lens, a Marfan's patient. Uh, you may not need the ct it may not be as critical but all patients the first device to go in for me would be the hooks to support the bag no that's fantastic one of the questions that also came up and i know you had a bit of a table that looked if the patient was myopic or their axial length how do you size the ctr how can you if you know that you're going to be putting in a ctr preoperatively what are you doing on your workup or your clinical exam to get the right ctr for the right patient So I think ninety five percent of the time it is one standard size. So the recommendation from Moshe is like you know if you have an axial length of twenty four to twenty eight, then you would go in with eleven thirteen CTR. So what eleven and thirteen means is the it, it it's eleven millimeters when it's in the bag when the capsule when the CTR is compressed. The ideal placement is that the eyelets of the CTR should just cross. That's that way you have the support uh, equatorially uh, all around. Uh, so that is the size you should have. So that is what I think would work in most cases. So even with slightly smaller eyes, this should work. But in very large eyes, in myopic eyes, then I think one should go in for the large CTRs. But that I think is is rare. But in most instances, eleven, thirteen would be fine to have as a backup. and maybe if you want a 12 14 the small rings would only be required in spherophytic eyes and you know and in very small eyes maybe in children or something and even in those eyes there is no harm in using a little larger ctr so you can always place 11 13 instead of a 10 12 
so you may not actually have to have it in your inventory yes no, i think that you can manage yeah, I think that's really important. I find a lot of people don't know if they have a CTR in their inventory until they need one urgently. Just like Dr. Vasavita said, having a kit ready, having high quality OVDs, uh, like Dr. Gerg said, are, is critical. One thing I'd like to hear from Dr. Uh, Prashant or Dr. Vasavita, Dr. Hirapriya made it look easy. I find, or I've seen so many times, the challenges are getting a good capsular rexus. You don't have the counter traction. It's hard to get a centered, uh, CCC when it's dislocated and you can't see it. Do you all have any, she made it look easy, but do you all have any tips or tricks or pearls to mention about doing a capsular rexus uh, on a patient with known zonular weakness or zonulopathy? Yeah. So I think the trick uh, was addressed by um, Hari Priya also. It is, it is always good to start the capsular rexus away from the genular weakness site. I think that's the first trick. And as you are approaching to the site of genular dialysis or weakness, you will be able to see that there is a difficulty in uh, ripping the capsule. In that situation, if you are facing that, switch over from the 26 gauge needle to using a, a capsular axis forcep, and then try to pull the and complete the capsular axis. So it, it usually is depending upon how much uh, uh, genular dialysis you are facing and difficulty you are facing. Yeah, and if you see that clumping or if you see the wrinkles before the leading edge, putting back in your OVD, I find a lot of times people are not re-injecting and that can be a secret to smoothing out that carpet where you lack the counter traction from zonules. I'm sorry, Dr. Basavita, did you want to add something here? I just wanted to add two things. I really find it difficult if it's a large area of subluxation to make the initial entry or the puncture sometimes is difficult. So instead of a, normally I would use a 26 gauge cystotome, but if that doesn't happen, I wouldn't hesitate in using a, an MVR style knife to create the initial puncture because you don't want to push the nucleus too much in trying to make that puncture. The other thing that I find useful because uh, I'm not uh, as skilled as Dr. Haripriya, she made it look like child's play. So what I also do is I would, if it's like Dr. Garg said, if it's very difficult in the area of the weak zonules, I would take uh, two side ports and two micro incision forceps. With one hand, I would support, pull the capsule or, or sort of support it. And then with the other, keep doing the rexes to give some sort of a counter traction. So these are two things I have found very useful uh, when you are not as experienced or if the case is really difficult. No, I think those are great tricks. Um, you know, moving on to the cornea, I know Prashant, you have spent your life worrying about endothelial cells. A few quick questions that people came up. If we don't have the ability to quantify through machines, the endothelial density or the endothelial health, how can you get rough approximations with the clinical exam with guttata density? And can we still move forward with FACO alone with mild guttata? Those would be combining two questions from the audience. Yeah. So I think these are very interesting questions. And uh, the, the, the parameters that one should take into account is the history of morning blurring of vision. And number two, if the density of guttata are uh, kind of covering more than six millimeter of the central area, then they are likely to, to lead to corneal edema postoperatively. And then if you do a good clinical examination, you will be able to see those stri, which I tried to show in my video. So the history of morning blurring of vision, uh, gutata is spreading into the central six millimeter of the cornea and presence of stri on clinical examination are the signs that this cornea is compromised and phacal emulsification may lead to corneal edema. Yes, sir. And one thing I'd like to ask maybe uh, you and then the others, Dr. Harapriya and Dr. Vasavada, is there anything you do differently with the post-op medications? Do you add more steroids? Do you add anything differently for patients who you know have uh, already compromised corneas? Is there anything you do differently post-operatively? Yeah, so in earlier we used to give them more intensive corticosteroid, but we have found that if the endothelial cell count uh, or the corneal edema is mild to moderate, they recover even with the conventional uh, post-operative regimens. 
Um, so I do not modify my regimens. I observe these patients over six weeks period and you find that those cases which have reasonable reserve of corneal endothelium, edema recovers in those patients. And Dr. Vasava, Dr. Harpreet, is there anything you do differently with known compromised endothelial cells, either preoperatively, intraoperatively, or postoperatively? Yeah, so I think very well uh, discussed. Uh, intraoperative, I would uh, take a lot more effort to ensure the phaco probe is at a deeper plane. Uh, obviously, that is something you know you, don't, you want to be as far away from the cornea as possible. So try to opt for a chop technique. Try to have you know good viscoelastic, which was emphasized uh, adequately, and keep make sure at no point you have to lift your probe, which means you have to have very good chamber stability have the right flow decks in place so that your probe can remain at the iris plane. That will be very important for me. And Dr. Vasavan, anything, any tricks for, for you about protecting those endothelial cells? Yeah, I think two things. In the preoperative period, if, if, the, if I have, have a serial follow-up the, of the patient, then I would try to push them for uh, surgery and uh, not wait till a very advanced stage because in our part of the world, particularly, especially if they find out that there is another comorbidity, they're really scared. When you talk to them about a possible TSEC or a DMEC, they may want to delay the surgery. So one thing I would like to discuss with the caregivers and the patient is don't wait too much and get it at a reasonable time. Then your chances of uh, hydrogenic injury are lesser. And uh, also the second thing in post-operative, as we talked about, probably in the first 24 hours, I would add an IOP lowering agent like a timolol or something, because I don't want any additional epithelial edema. Otherwise, I don't think everything was very well said, and I would not change the post-operative regime much. Yeah, and one of the questions, uh, Prashant, that was asked during your talk was, do you see a role or does femtosecond assisted surgery, does that help? Is that something you'd put in your you're planning uh, with a patient with known compromised endothelial cells? Well, that's a wonderful question. And uh, 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 the addition of the femtosecond uh, laser um, uh, nucleotomy is, is very useful in these patients because the, the nuclear fragmentation is already done and therefore you are likely to consume less of phaco energy and more of aspiration of these pieces. So if one has an access to to femtosecond machine, then they should definitely advise these patients to undergo that procedure. Yeah, and going back to Dr. Harapriyas, I know some people with that known zonulopathy actually use the femtosecond for the CCC because they don't they don't make it look like Dr. Vasava said like child's play. So I know that femtosecond sometimes has a role in the challenging cases, either reducing the CDE or the uh, difficulty in getting a well-centered CCC. The last question for you, uh, Prashant, was about DWEC. Is there a role? And obviously there's been an explosion of lamellar procedures over the last 15 years. What, what procedures are, is your go-to for a patient with known Fuchs dystrophy? What is your best corneal procedure or the one that you feel most comfortable with, uh, with a planned uh, FACO and lamellar procedure? So um, I think if I talk about say three years earlier, we were doing the DSEC with the FACO emulsification and after the advent of DMAC, uh, we have switched over to DMAC and FACO emulsification. The advantage is that you have lesser risk of allograft rejection and the cornea regains uh, thickness very quickly. Um, so that, so the need for long-term corticosteroid is reduced drastically. I have not tried uh, doing desmetorexis uh, alone. And I think that procedure probably will be difficult to combine with fake emulsification. Yeah, I would agree. And I think, you know, Prashant, I've worked with you a lot around the world. You're extremely good at speaking to the family and the patients. I think letting patients know that they may need a second procedure and, and getting that expectation in their head ahead of time is important. So that if three years, five years down the road, they already know that their, their cornea is already compromised and trying to do too much and too many different procedures at the same time can be challenging, especially when you're still learning all these new techniques. Um, Dr. Vasavada, one of the questions that came up during your PCR talk 
was the use of a scaffold IOL so that before removing residual fragments, do you see any advantages of trying to place a IOL in the eye beforehand? Maybe you can talk about what is a scaffold IOL and when you might use that uh, interoperatively. That's a great question. So first of all, I mean, what do we mean by a scaffold? In the good old days, there used to be a sheet glide and now you could use a, an IOL. So basically when you have a rupture, like you saw with my case, and you still have a large chunk of the cataract remaining inside the bag, you put in an IOL and you uh, slide it in behind the residual nucleus so that, and then you emulsify that nucleus in front of the intraocular lens. That is what is the whole concept of intraocular lens scaffold. Personally speaking, I'm, I have never done it and I'm not a very big fan of this technique for two reasons. Number one, uh, because if there is vitreous in the eye, unless if you want to use a scaffold, please use it, but only after performing an anterior vitrectomy. Most people tend to think that once you have a mechanical barrier, just because you can't see the vitreous, it's not there and it's not affecting your uh, post-operative outcome. So I think that is a trap we don't want to fall into. You may do an adequate vitrectomy and then inject the IOL behind the remaining lens material and then emulsify it in front. So uh, I don't use it. If I did have to use it, maybe I, I would use it where there's completely no capsular support. But then the thing is that stability of that IOL is also an issue. There can I have seen cases where that scaffold IOL can drop into the retina and you add one more surgery where you could have managed without that. So personally for me, I'm not a big fan of any, either a glide or a IOL. I would rather, if it drops, I would let it drop and then have a retinal surgeon handle it in a much more elegant manner post-operatively two or three days down the line if I don't have access to a retinal surgeon right away. But I would appreciate uh, madam's and sir's comments on this thing. Yeah, so I uh, would, I think I would agree with all the points which uh, Vaishali uh, shared. Uh, I would use a scaffold sometimes. I think a case like this would be a good case because there was no vitreous, which was very well managed. So once the vitreous is taken care of, one can uh, ensure you, but again, you'll have to ensure your wound size is not enlarged. It has to be a 2.8 or a 2.2 because otherwise you can't emulsify the nucleus. So you, your wound has to be good uh, and you have to ensure your lens doesn't again slip into the bag or something. So you should be careful to place it either in the anterior chamber or in the sulcus and then do the emulsification. It's an extra uh, one more thing in the, uh, in the eye. So one has to be aware of it, which means you'll have less space to work, which can make it safer, but also that you'll also have to be careful about the endothelium. And Dr. Garg, did you have any experience or any comments there with scaffold aisles? No, I, I, I have not used the scaffold IOL because I feel the same as Vaishali said, that if you have left some vitreous there, uh, it will give you a false sense and you, you most likely are going to be pulling or putting a lot of traction on the vitreous body. So yeah. I, I usually uh, do the complete vitrectomy first. And then after, once your vitrectomy is done, the capsular opening stabilizes very well. And you can use bimanual for your phaco emulsification as well as cortical aspiration. No, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Harapriya, we do have a question. And again, you, you make it look easy. Uh, with a known zonular dialysis case, do you do anything differently with a hydrodissection? Do you do smaller bursts, more, more rotation? And what do you do with lens rotation? Um, do you still do that after a hydro? So I guess the question is, do you modify either your hydrodissection or your lens rotation in a known case of zonular dialysis? Yeah, so the hydrodissection is a very important step. So I think it's a very uh, relevant question because, uh, because of the lack of zonules, the additions are much stronger between the capsule and the uh, 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 cortex. So hydrodissection has to be done. So the placement is important. We don't want to insert the fluid at the site of, you know, going through the zonules. It has to be in the capsular bag. So identify your rexus rim and then inject the fluid. And again, as you suggested, using small bursts of fluid is good instead of having an overzealous hydrodissection, but at different sites. So you kind of ensure you're doing 
a good hydro resection, but small amount of flow, kind of have spurts of flow at different directions and ensure this is complete. In terms of nucleus rotation, I don't do rotation normally uh, for the routine cases, but for someone who does it for all cases, I would suggest you continue doing it in these patients as well. Uh, at the same time, please remember the zonules are weak. So one would have to be careful, use two instruments by manual rotation very gently. The reason I'm saying it is you don't, it's probably safer to do it mechanically with your Sinsky rather than trying to do it for the first time with your FACO probe. So if you are a surgeon who would do it before your FACO would start, I would say do continue, but be a little bit more gently. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask all three of you all. I know, Dr. Harapriya, you mentioned how you start or place the beginning of your CCC based on the location of the zonular dialysis. One question from the audience is, do you change the incision location based on the location of zonular weakness? So I'm gonna ask all three of you all, and again, we'll start with Dr. Hirapriya, then Prashant, and then Dr. Vasavana. So how does zonular, if and how does zonular dialysis affect your wound location? Yeah, so I would, my preferred incision site is obviously uh, temporal. The only time I would change my site and go superior is if there is a temporal zonular dialysis. The reason being, I don't want to enter straight where there could be a vitreous prolapse. So I would like to enter at a site where there is, you know, there is not, uh, where, where it's not the site of maximum zonular loss. So in that case, I would go at the superior site. But, but besides that, I have uh, no other indication for changing my incision site. The only thing I don't want to encounter as I enter is vitreous. That's the only thing I would like to avoid if I can. But if there's a large dialysis, both superiorly and temporarily, then there's obviously no other option but to go uh, with the temporal wound. And Prashant, do you have any other comments there? No, I think uh, I use the same strategy that uh, my preferred temporal, preferred site of incision is temporal. And uh, I, I may switch my um, capsular access from the side port and the main port, depending on the ease with which I can do the access. And Dr. Vasavid, any other tricks or tips that you have to offer here? I, I think I agree, same, temporal, unless you also, because vitreous, like uh, Dr. Haripriya said, and if you need to fixate any of the rings or devices on the temporal side, you want to leave that side empty. So mostly it's temporal, otherwise supra-temporal. All right. Well, we have obviously at CyberSight, we have a consult service and we often get some of the most challenging questions asked, very rare syndromes or rare uh, findings that they want to consult experts like the panel here. Two very specific questions we have in the Q&A that are pretty rare diseases. And the first one is ice syndrome, irritocorneal endothelial syndrome. We'll start with the cornea expert, uh, Prashant. Do you do anything, is there any special recommendations you have? I know you talked about corneal compromise with Fuchs dystrophy, with ICE syndrome. Is there anything you do differently as you plan your cataract surgery? Then again, I'd like to hear from Dr. Harapriya and Basavada. So if the patient, I'll use the same algorithm even for the ICE syndrome uh, that you need to uh, assess the endothelial function beforehand. You should also look at the, uh, the degree of uh, synechia and iris uh, um, tremulousness, because these are the factors that are going to make our surgery more difficult. But once you have done that uh, you, and the pupil is dilating, then you can go ahead with the routine capsular access and phaco emulsification. However, in some of these patients, the pupillary dilatation becomes a challenge, or at times the the iris is so tremulous that it keeps getting into the phaco emulsification port. And if you notice any of these signs, it is safer to put the iris hook in order to keep iris away from the phaco emulsification site and go ahead with the cataract surgery. Always remember that post-operatively, some of these patients develop raised intraocular pressure and you need to monitor very closely uh, these spikes in intraocular pressure and manage them appropriately. Thank you, uh, Prashant. And Dr. Harapriya, is there anything you do when you're looking at a patient with eye syndrome as you plan your surgery on how to protect the cornea or how to get the iris out of the way uh, during surgery? Is there anything you do differently? 
I don't think I have anything more to add. I think Prashant has very clearly said exactly what I would be concerned with IOP, endothelium, iris. So I would look at all this right viscoelastic. Uh, in terms of nanophthalmos, I would uh, probably look at, you know, doing a B scan pre op. I may work with the VR surgeon to have a steroidectomy done. And that would uh, help me have a much better anterior chamber, especially when doing very small eyes, like 16 millimeters, 17 millimeters, there's a very high chance of an expulsive hemorrhage. So I would ensure I would you know, have them do the sclerostomy, posterior sclerostomy, and then perform the fake emulsification. And Dr. Vasavan, anything you do differently with either a patient with eye syndrome or nanophthalmos? No, I think everything has been well discussed. Eye syndrome, everything was well laid out. Nanophthalmos, yes, same thing. I, these are the cases eye syndrome and uh, nanophthalmos, which also brings out an important point that it's good to have not only a cataract surgeon, but the other uh, expert like a corneal surgeon or the retinal surgeon with you. So co-management is something that really gets highlighted in these cases. And you can only give really good outcomes when you are co-managing with the right experts. So I would have a retinal surgeon and again, the use of a heavy viscoelastic in this a viscoadaptive OVD would be my choice, along with a dispersive OVD to coat the endothelium. And then the other issue, obviously, is the IOL power calculation and what kind of lens you would put. But that's a little more uh, non-surgical thing. But I think these are the two main issues. No, uh, that, that's fantastic. I mean, I can't thank you all enough. I, I know all three of you are incredibly busy, busy as surgeons, as trainers and hospital leaders. Uh, we answered, I think, all the questions. Uh, so, up, uh, oh, sorry, we got one more. All right. So, and Dr. Vasavan, I'm going to have you answer this one. Uh, in many of our operating rooms, they may not have the automated vitrector. And so if there's not a vitrectomy machine, how do we manage vitreous prolapse? What do you do? What is, what is your management strategy when there's not an automated vitrector? So I think uh, that's a great question because there, there are parts of the world and country where you may not have at that time access to a vitrector. So the best you can do would be, one thing I would never do is a wick or a, or a sort of a sponge vitrectomy. I would uh, go through a side port I would probably enlarge, if you don't have a micro incision scissors, enlarge a side port and use the scissors to excise as much vitreous using a gentle spatula traction, although it's not ideal. But I would, if, if possible, even if I can transport the patient, maybe in a couple of days to a center where there is a vitrector, I would not be very enthusiastic in uh, proving a point and putting in an IOL at any cost. So try and remove as much vitreous manually as you can. And if you feel that a lot of the cortex or the lens, the fragments are left behind, close the eye, suture it up, give good anti-inflammatory and IOP treatment. And if possible, please, even if it means sometimes doing it at your or the hospital expense, let the patient travel to a center where they can do a good cleanup and then put in the IOL in the sulcus. That would be my genuine recommendation. No, that's, that's fantastic. I agree. One thing people don't realize is the wick, the wick, the wick cell or the cotton bud as you touch it against the vitreous, the absorption actually pulls traction as soon as they touch. So uh, again, I just wanna end this incredible webinar as we began by thanking uh, all of you all for taking the time. I wanna thank all of our attendees from all over the world. Uh, we had a great year, even though 2021 was a challenging year. Uh, we've had a great year on CyberSight and we wanna thank everyone for making that possible. So again, Prashant, uh, Dr. Vasavada, and Dr. Harapriya, we hope all you, your team, and your families have a very healthy and happy new year. And thank you for all you do in global ophthalmology. Thanks, Santa. And thank from our end also, uh, to you, all the members of the cyber site and their families, as well as all the participants, have a wonderful year. Hopefully, we should see the end of the pandemic and we should be able to meet in person. Yes. Yeah, yes. hoping the same. Thank you thank so much. You. Thank you. Thank you, Hunter. And thanks for the incredible work you do even on a personal level. Thank you. Well, I hope everyone has a good year. And this is our last webinar of the year. Thank you, Lawrence, for seeing every single one of us through this webinar. So have a great day, everyone. And thank you for your questions and participation.